If you have your Bibles, please turn to the book of 2 Chronicles. That's easy to find. It's right after 1 Chronicles. It's in the Old Testament. If you go past uh, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and you get through Joshua, Judges, Ruth, then you find 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, then you'll get there, 1 and 2 Chronicles. Pages of your Bible there might stick together a little bit. It's not something that we study that frequently, but I believe the Lord has a message for us here this morning. If he doesn't have one for you, he certainly has one for me, and I just want to share with you what I think he's been telling me. Would you pray with me before we look into God's word together? Our God, Jehovah, Lord, you are the God who is, the God who was, the God who is to come. You've always been there, you always will be there, and you're with us now. And Lord, that should bring us perfect peace and rest, but it doesn't always. Lord, sometimes we get our our eyes off of you and, and we tend to look at our circumstances instead of trusting in you, Lord. So I pray as we look into your word today, you would remind us of the promises of your word, you, you remind us of your faithfulness to us, and that you remind us of how we can strengthen our faith in you. May your spirit fall on each heart here this morning, Lord, and may you speak directly to them. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. <coughs> I'm sorry, that didn't work. <laughs> Microphone works, though. Um, well, let's, uh, let's look at the first couple verses here. In uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, it says, After this, the Moab, I'm reading from the ESV version, English Standard Version, so if yours is a little different, just, just follow along. After this, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and with them, some of the Meunites came against Jehoshaphat for battle. That wasn't me. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea. And behold, they are in Hazazan Tamar. Sure, why not? <laughs> that is En Gedi. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid. I'm going to stop there. You got problems? <laughs> you got worries? I love the King James Version there because it says a great horde was coming against Jehoshaphat. Did you ever feel that way, like a great horde? Is coming against you maybe it's uh, financial maybe you've got that final notice overdue foreclosure notice something is is pressuring 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 and you can't see how you're gonna get through it or around it maybe it's your marriage maybe that feels like a giant horde is coming against you when there's unsettledness in the home it can feel overwhelming maybe you're crying out to God God I don't know how I'm gonna get through this Maybe it's your health. Maybe it's you or someone you love. Maybe it's the big C word or some other health disaster. And you're sitting there going, I, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. Maybe it's your kids or another relationship. We all come to those times where we feel like everything is getting worse. As a matter of fact, I was just counseling with a friend this week, and he says, I'm not going to say that anymore because every time I say, I don't think it can get any worse, it gets worse. <laughs> And I've been there. Maybe you're there right now. Jehoshaphat was certainly there. He's got three different armies joining together just to come at him. The Moabites, the Ammonites, and I don't even know who these guys are, the Meunites. They sound terrible. A bunch of little people going, me, 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 me. All about themselves. We, we, they, they come, if you, just to give you a little bit of, uh, a, a very little bit of geography, Israel is roughly the size and shape of New Jersey. The only difference is their, their coast is on the west side and, and they, they border a lot of enemy countries on their east side. And, and the Jordan River kind of comes down as a natural boundary. All these people that are coming against them are from the east side of the Jordan. It would be like if the Philadelphians decided to attack us over here, right? We, the distance between where they are and say maybe Cherry Hill or Marlton, about 12 miles where this horde had been gathered together and they're about to attack the nation of Israel. And Jehoshaphat is the king and he's afraid. You know, that's a proper response to a lot of our situations is fear. 
right? The Bible never says that we will be absent of fear, but what we choose to do in our response to that fear is what makes all the difference. It tells in 1 John that perfect love casts away all fear. In Psalm 34, it tells us he will deliver us from all of our fears. He doesn't say he's going to take away our circumstances. He doesn't say everything's always going to be peachy and sunny and rainbows. Exactly. <laughs> he never promises that, but he does say that he will never leave us or forsake us. He does say that he will walk with us. He does say he will take us through the storm. And it's, it's how we respond to that fear that makes all the difference. And Jehoshaphat it does not respond like most people in his position. So who is Jehoshaphat? Well, the first thing you need to know is he's the king of Judah. Like I said, Israel's about the size of New Jersey, and they had a united kingdom for a few years. Under King Saul, King David, King Solomon, they were a united kingdom. <coughs> Pardon me. After Solomon, his son Rehoboam came in, and, and there, was a, there was basically a civil war and a split. And from that time on, kind of like 195 divides our state, you can draw a line across Israel. And, and the northern part of the kingdom, they called Israel. The, the ten tribes of Israel, they stayed in the north. And then the kingdom in the south became known as the kingdom of Judah. It was Judah and Benjamin and, and, and some others. But essentially, those two tribes made up the southern kingdom. And what we know about the northern kingdom is they had about... 19 or 20 kings in their history, and not one of them followed after the ways of the Lord. They were all evil and wicked in his sight. And after a certain amount of time, the north got invaded by the Assyrians, and they got taken captive, and their kingdom was no more. In the southern kingdom of Judah, there were anywhere, depending on Bible scholars and how you read the scriptures, there was as few as five and as many as eight out of their 20 kings that followed after the ways of the Lord. Right? So it's still, the average, the numbers aren't really that good. Right? So the kings of Judah, though, they had a few that were good, that they tried to follow the ways of the Lord, to obey, his, to obey the law, the, 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 uh, the Torah, the five books of the Old Testament that was written down by Moses. And Jehoshaphat was one of these kings. He was the son of Asa, and Asa was a godly man who followed the Lord. So, you know, moms and dads, it doesn't always guarantee that your kids will follow the Lord, but if you give them a good foundation and a good example of you following the Lord, chances are they're going to make that decision too. Uh, if you flip back just to chapter 17, just to give you a quick description of who Jehoshaphat was, chapter 17, starting in verse 3, it says, The Lord was with Jehoshaphat. Why? Because he walked in the earlier ways of his father David. He did not seek the Baals, which are the false gods of the Canaanites, but he sought the God of his father and walked in his commandments, not according to the practices of Israel, which is the northern kingdom. Therefore the Lord established the kingdom in his hand. And all Judah brought tribute to Jehoshaphat, and he had great riches and honor. Verse 6, his heart was courageous in the ways of the Lord. And he took away the high places of the ashram. He took down, he got rid of the idol worship, which unfortunately some kings had allowed to exist alongside of the worship of the true and living God. They would kind of turn a blind eye, say, well, you know, they're not hurting anybody. But God said, no, you can have no other gods before me. I like that. It says his heart was courageous. It, uh, some of the versions say it took delight in the law and the ways of the Lord. And that's an unusual verb in the Old Testament. I think the author is trying to emphasize that Jehoshaphat's walk with God was unusual and significant. It tells us in chapter 19 some other things about Jehoshaphat. In verse 4 it says, He lived at Jerusalem. That's a good place to live because that's where the, the castle was. And he went out again among the people from Beersheba to the hill country of Ephraim and brought them back to the Lord, the God of their fathers. He brought them back, which means they had wandered away. As a matter of fact, it tells us that Jehoshaphat sent not only civil leaders, but he sent some priests and Levites, the, the keepers of, of the law, out into the community. He sent them into every part of his kingdom specifically to instruct people in the law of the Lord. See, unfortunately, back then, they didn't have copies of the Bible. You know, they didn't have one in their glove box. They didn't have one they left and lost and found at church so they could pick it up on Sunday when they were there. They didn't have, you know, the, uh, the father's Bible, the mother's Bible. We have, we have Bibles everywhere. The problem is people who have them don't necessarily always read them. In, in the book of Amos, um, uh, God criticized the people. He said that there was a famine of the hearing of the word of God. There wasn't a famine of the word of God. We don't have a famine of the word of God in our country today. 
but we do have a famine of the hearing of the Word of God. As a matter of fact, this, this world is more blanketed by the Word of God than it ever has been in its history through satellite TV and the internet and radio signals. The, the Word of God has gone into more parts of the globe than it ever has before. But there certainly is a famine of the hearing of the Word of God. And Jehoshaphat said, that's not going to happen in my kingdom. So he sent out uh, the, the priest to teach the people. Right? He also set up a, a civil and a religi religious judiciary. He, he was able to amass an army, it tells us in chapter 17, of over a million soldiers. But yet when this problem arises, it's not his army. It's not the Supreme Court that Jehoshaphat goes to and relies on. It tells us exactly what he does. Look at verse 3. It says, Then Jehoshaphat was afraid, our normal reaction, and... He set his face to seek the Lord. He set his face to seek the Lord. See, I'm gonna, I found about seven steps that I f see in this passage. There could be more, but I found seven. Seven steps to help us to know what does that mean? Because we hear that, seek the Lord, seek the Lord. But what does it look like? How do we do it? How do we get there? Well, I'm glad you asked. Even if you didn't ask, we're, I'm glad that you're here. <laughs> Because Jehoshaphat does it. He set his face. That's an interesting term. Do you ever meet somebody, they set their face? I think of my daughter. She's not here. She's at college, so I can talk about her. Um, Leah, she wasn't even two years old yet. She didn't even really have speaking skills. You know, she could speak a few words here and there. And I remember we were at my father-in-law's house. He lives over in Levittown. And he lives on a, a street. It's not a busy street, but it's busy enough. Cars are going by. And, and we were raking leaves out in his yard. And, it, you know, he had a lot of trees, so there was leaves everywhere. As a matter of fact, where the, the sidewalk and the curb met the street, the leaves were piled up so high, it was hard to distinguish between the curb and the street. And while we were raking, I, I, out of the corner of my eye, I'm keeping an eye on Leah. She's just going around, you know, doing her thing, picking up leaves. And I notice, you know, she goes off the sidewalk into the leaves in the street, but she doesn't know. So I go over and I pick her up and I say, no, you got to stay on the sidewalk over here. And I put her on over here and she, hmm. yeah, she didn't like that. So as soon as I turn around, she went back to the spot that she, she liked those leaves in the street better than the ones on the sidewalk. I said, all right, how do I make her understand? So I picked her up, I held her, you know, eye level with me, and I said, no, you can't go in the street. And I said, if you do that again, I'm going to give you a little, you know, medicine. <laughs> I put her down, and now this time, though, I could see it. She set her face. Do you ever see somebody do that? Which just, you, I could tell by looking at her, I'm not listening to you. You're not the boss of me. <laughs> Basically, she didn't have the words to say out loud, but her face, if I could read it, that's exactly what it was saying. You can't tell me what to do. And sure enough, I kept an eye. I went back to Rakin, but I was watching her, and she was, in a very determined way, marched right over, and, you know, one thing led to another, and she had to get the medicine. <sighs> but my point is, she was determined. Did you ever meet somebody like that? Maybe you're married to somebody like that? <laughs> we'll pray for you if you are. Maybe you are somebody like that. You don't want anything until someone tells you you can't have it. Well, Jehoshaphat was the opposite of that, and that's the heart that we should have. He was not determined to go against the Lord, to do the opposite of what the Lord wanted. It said he set his face to seek the Lord. How determined are you to seek the Lord, especially when the horde is attacking, when you're getting hit from all directions at the same time? Do you set your face to seek the Lord, or do you just cry out after the fact, Lord, help me, help me? Jehoshaphat, the first thing he did was he set his face to seek the Lord. He didn't go to the captain of his army and say, how many troops do we have? He didn't go to the treasurer and say, how much money do we have in reserve? He didn't go to the king of Syria or the king of Israel and say, hey, I need help. Can you come back me up? He set his face to seek the Lord, right? And I believe that determines his success or his failure. But also it says he proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah. Now, a fast... That's, that's an extreme call for an extreme measure. And, 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 and fasting basically is to withhold, in this case, food so that you can focus your prayer and your spirit and your soul more intently on God. The Lord Jesus would often talk about fasting and praying and, and practiced it himself. The, the New Testament church did that. But what you have to understand is fasting is not some magic wand that you wave to get God to do what you want. 
right? You don't put God in some kind of chokehold, right? I remember when I was a kid, I used to watch the WWF and Greg the Hammer Valentine, right? He was famous for the figure four. And once he locked that leg lock on you, it was submission every time. No one could withstand that hammer, Greg the Hammer Valentine. And, and when you fast, it's not like you're putting God in a leg lock and he has to give you what you want. If that's the reason you fast, you're not helping yourself. What fasting is intending to do, intended to do, is to draw our hearts into a more closer relationship with God. When you, when you sacrifice food, all of a sudden you become very aware your body's need for food. Fasting has never been a strong suit of mine. I remember one time I, I was fasting with my daughter. She had to go on an apple diet. She was dealing with some kind of medical condition and the doctor said that if she went on this fast for three days where she ate only apples and drank only water, it would help clear up this condition. So I said, as a good father, I'll do it with you. Man, was that a dumb thing to do. <laughs> There's only so many apples you can eat, guys. And all of a sudden, all you can think about is steak. <laughs> Meat, calories, starches. Carbohydrates are so wonderful. But we, we become very much in tune with our appetite. And I think the, uh, the idea of a fast is to get that same singleness of mind on our prayer life, on our relationship to God. So in some extreme times, not to get God to do what you want, but to be able to, to set yourself in alignment with God better, fasting is sometimes the way to go. He didn't just proclaim it for himself, he, all of Judah. And then what did he do next in verse 4? And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. See, sometimes Satan's greatest weapon, when we're faced with obstacles, with pressures, with we feel overwhelmed, we isolate. And Satan loves to get us in a place where we're isolated, where we feel like we're all alone, where we feel like no one loves us, no one cares about us, no one supports us. So what do we do? We stop going to church. We, we stay away from Bible study. We don't want to tell anybody else what we're going through. And, and Jehoshaphat said, no, bring everybody together. In Hebrews, it tells us, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, but encourage one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Our job, folks, is to be a support and encouragement for those of us among us who are going through the trials, who are going through the tragedies, who are facing the obstacles. They should never have to do it alone. If you, if you walk in part of the body of Christ, you should never have to be alone. And Jehoshaphat knew that, so he called everyone together. There is great strength in community. And then, that was, you know, he fast, he sought the Lord by what? Fasting, assembly together, and then in verse five, he prays. <coughs> I'm sorry. Let's read his prayer. It says, and Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah. Imagine that, the king. Imagine if our president would stand in the assembly and humbly pray a prayer like this. Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord. Where was that? The temple. Before the new court, and he said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? And they have lived in it and have built for you in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. And now behold, the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came from the land of Egypt, and whom they avoided and did not destroy, behold, they are rewarding us by coming to drive us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. Our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. What a prayer. What a prayer. Let's, let's, look, let's take that apart a little bit. Right? The first thing Jehoshaphat does in the beginning of that prayer is he reminds himself and he reminds the people of Judah of exactly who God is. He recounts God's faithfulness to them over the years. As a nation of Israel, God has been with them from the time of Abraham and Moses through Egypt in the wilderness, and he brought them into this land. And it's good 
when you're going through a trial, to remember God's past faithfulness to you. You need to remind yourself. Men, fathers, you need to remind your families of what God has done for you personally. And you need to humbly, not, not, not demand anything from God. He made no request in this prayer. He just reminded the people and himself of exactly who God was. Because God changes not. His mercies, they fail not. They are new every morning. God is an unchangeable God, and that's a good thing because the God who had been with them is the God who is with them now, and he's the God who's with us today. And then he goes and he, and he reminds, <clears throat> excuse me, he reminds God of what God had said. He takes the promises right from Scripture. He goes back to um, chapter 6 of 2 Chronicles is where Solomon dedicates the temple that he's actually standing in at the moment. And Solomon offered a prayer, which is really just a reiteration of what God had spoken to the children of Israel in the, in the end of the book of Deuteronomy. He basically said, if you obey my commands, I will be with you. I will protect you. I will not let the enemy defeat you. I will not let sword or famine or pestilence, all these things he named, I'm not going to let them happen. But if you go after other gods and you serve them, these things are going to happen to you, and that's because I'm allowing it to happen to drive you back to me. And it tells us in chapters 17, 18, and 19 that Jehoshaphat had did the work. He had drawn the, part, the hearts of the people back to God. They had been serving other gods. They had been worshiping other gods. They had been sacrificing to other gods. And he got rid of all that. And he sent the word of God out so the people could hear and remember and come back to what they knew to be true. So he said, I've done that. And God, because I've done that, now I'm calling on you to do what you said that you would do. And you know what? It is okay to pray to God what he has promised to us in Scripture. He wants us to claim his promises. You can't claim them if you don't know them. If you don't know them, open up his book and find out what they are. Because they weren't just for 2,000 years ago, for, for 2,800 years ago, for those people. His promises are for us today too. As a matter of fact, we have a more full revelation than they did. We have the entire scripture, Old and New Testament, right? And Hebrews tells us in these last days, God has spoken to us by his son. The full revelation of God is Jesus Christ. They didn't have that here, but they were determined to claim God's promises for themselves. You can claim God's promises when you're in the midst of a trial. You are not demanding anything from God. You're just reminding him of what he's already promised you. And the third thing he does is he reminds God well, he doesn't remind God. He reminds the people of what obedience gets for them. If they will obey God, God will defend them. They, he will fight for them. He will come to their aid. And I love the end of his prayer in verse 12. Three things in that last verse. It says, for we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. The first thing he does is he admits that he is completely powerless as a king, as a leader, as a man. Yes. He is powerless against this horde. And folks, some of us want to fight and strain and strive and use every resource we have before we'll allow God to work in our lives. And God says, go ahead, you can do it that way. Or you can admit that you're powerless. It's, it's, it's interesting to me that every one of those 12-step groups out there, whether it's Alcoholics Anonymous or Gamblers Anonymous or uh, Narcotics Anonymous, they all have that step in there where you have to admit that you are powerless over the thing that's controlling you, the addiction that you have. And I believe that comes from Scripture, that idea that we are powerless, right? We are without resource to fight against the enemy and his wiles that are against us. And sometimes he uses physical things, sometimes he uses financial things and emotional things to come against us. But when we admit we are powerless, some people think that that means defeat. With God, when you admit that you're powerless, he says, it's exactly where I want you to be. Now step aside. <laughs> step aside, surrender your will to his and see what he can do for you. I can think of uh, a few times in my life, and unfortunately there's only a few, where I felt that powerlessness, where I felt like the storms were beating down on me and I didn't know what to do. There was one time where 
I was unemployed. This is probably about 12 or 15 years ago. I had, uh, my buddy started a business and it looked great. He hired me to be with him. Um, but things weren't as, as rosy as he had thought. And in a short time, his business went belly up. So before he actually shut down the business, he, he had to lay me off, which was gracious because I was able to at least collect unemployment during that time. But I can't say that I was praising the Lord going, oh, Lord, this is great. Thank you. <laughs> but I remember sitting there at the table and the bills were piling up. And I got to tell you, unemployment's a nice thing, but it doesn't, it doesn't exactly meet the need that I had. Right? At the time, we had three children. We had a mortgage. We had two cars and very little income. And I remember putting those bills all out and going, Lord, I don't know what to do. I've been washing windows, cutting lawns, doing everything, anything I could to earn a little extra income, but it still wasn't enough. And I remember very specifically, there was one bill, I, I wish I could remember the exact amount, but, but it had to be paid, and we didn't have it. And I said, I don't know what to do. So we prayed. I wish it was my first resort instead of my last resort, <laughs> but we prayed. And don't you know, within a couple of days, that exact amount of that bill showed up in an envelope from friends of ours that had no idea of our need. They had no idea of the amount of that bill. The Lord had just laid on her heart to send us that amount, and it was the exact amount. I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. Another time, I was actually a very similar season of life while I was unemployed. Uh, the Lord actually used that, and it's a long story, and I'll tell it to you another time, but he, he had led my heart into, into ministry to pursue the calling that he'd put on me a long time before, and I was candidating with this church in Bedford, Pennsylvania. And if you don't know where Bedford, Pennsylvania is, join the club, because it's in the middle of nowhere. You just drive for about five hours west, and you're there, right? It's, it's, it's in the middle of nowhere. It's very uh, agrarian. It's very different from the Philadelphia metro region that I had become accustomed to. And I know my wife and I, when we first found out about that opportunity, it was kind of like, ah, God, I'm not sure about this. But he directed our hearts and he let us believe that that is where he wanted us to be. And we weren't just, you know, investigating it. You know, all our eggs were in that basket. <coughs> we had our house on the market. They led us to believe that they were going to offer me that position, but there was a couple little things they had to work out, so they didn't officially offer it to me. And then a couple weeks went by, and then they would talk to me and say, no, everything's good. And then a couple more weeks would go by, and then a month went by. And before I knew it, several months had gone by, and they still hadn't offered me the position. Now, I don't know about you guys, but if you've ever been on employment, it doesn't last forever, right? This was, I thought, I'm going to get this job, everything's going to be fine, so I didn't seek a lot of other employment while I was pursuing this, because we thought we were moving. And then my, my unemployment was going to run out in the beginning of February, and it was January. It was actually late in January, because I remember the Eagles were losing a playoff game to the New Orleans Saints. <laughs> and I got a phone call, and it was the, the fellow who was doing the pastoral duties of the church, and he said, I have some really bad news. I said, we decided to rescind that offer. We're going we're to offer it to somebody else. Whew, talk about blindside. <laughs> had no idea what was going to happen. I had no other plan. I had two weeks left of unemployment, and then I figured, well, I got I to gotta get something. But I remember somewhere deep inside of me, I heard a voice, and it just simply said, Greg, do you trust me? And I said, yeah, but you got to do something, Lord. <laughs> and I remember that next morning, I had my Bible out. I was praying. I can still remember the chair I was sitting in, green plaid chair, very ugly. <laughs> and I was crying out to God, God, please show me what to do because I don't know. And the phone rang. It actually startled me. <laughs> and it was my friend who, who was a pastor at Fellowship Alliance and he, he knew I was looking for something in ministry but he didn't know where I was and he said, hey, we have a position here. We thought you might be interested in it. <laughs> God doesn't always call me directly like that. <laughs> Sometimes he does. And then a couple years ago, I have a daughter I have a lot of daughters, but this one in particular, she was about to graduate high school and she said, Dad, I feel like God's telling me to go to Uganda for, for four months. And I remember going, God, no, come on. <laughs> I don't know what to do here, God. Everything in me is screaming, no! That same voice said, Greg, do you trust me? God, it's easy to trust you with me, 
Now you want me to trust you with her? Do you trust me? I don't know what to do. And, and listen, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back and say, oh, what a great spiritual champion I am because these three isolated occasions I was able to not panic, to trust the Lord and watch him provide for me. What I'm trying to say to you is, if he can do it for me, he delights to do it for you. I wish I could say that every time I had a dilemma that the same result came. I remember one time I, I, I got passed over for a promotion. I was working for a, a, a pharmaceutical company and I didn't like the fact that I got passed over for a promotion so I quit on the spot. And I came home and I told Maria and she says, we have two kids and a mortgage. What are you gonna do to pay for that? But I, I got passed over. How dare you be so rational and logical? <laughs> See, I, I, didn't, I didn't seek the Lord. I didn't set my face to seek him. I didn't fast. I didn't pray. I just got angry and I quit. And for the next year, I had some financial difficulties as a result of my pride and my arrogance. So I just don't want you to think it's always good examples. <laughs> so Jehoshaphat prays. He says, I'm powerless and I don't know what to do. do do you, are, do you feel that this morning where you're in a place where you said, I don't know what to do? But he, he actually did know what to do. He said, my eyes are on you. That makes all the difference. Right? I titled this sermon, How Do I Look? Right? And, and I'm not talking about how do I look. I, please do not comment on how I look. Right? <laughs> I think of uh, the original Batman movie back in 1989 with Jack Nicholson, Michael Keaton as Batman, and there's one scene where Jack Nicholson's looking in the mirror and he's you know, fixing his tie and his girlfriend comes up behind him and she says, you look fine. And he says, I didn't ask, right? <laughs> That's like the type of how do I look that I'm talking about here. How do I look? Where do my eyes go when I'm in trouble? Really, the better title should be to whom do I look? And that's the question I have for all of you this morning. Who are you looking to when you're in trouble? Who are you looking to first? Where does your help come from? Let's keep going. Sorry, I got hung up there for a while. Verse 13. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, right? Meanwhile, all of Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. I love that verse, right? Men, listen up. According to scripture, you are the high priest of your household. How many problems do we have in this country because men refuse to stand up on the promises of God, to take his word seriously, and to live after character and integrity by the word of God? Men, stand up. Stop letting your wives lead you spiritually. It's time to stand up to bring your little ones and your children before the Lord and let them hear you say, God, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. Because more is caught than taught, right? You can tell them all day what they should believe and what they should do, but they're gonna do what you do. It's a serious responsibility. It's time to step up. It says they stood though. Why they were standing, it indicates that they stood silently which is, that's, that, that's no small feat for several million people to gather in one place and to really be silenced. But the idea is after Jehoshaphat offered his prayer up to God, they stood and they waited for his response. How many times do we not hear God because we don't take time to listen for him? We go with our list, we go with our requests, we go with our demands, God I need, God give me, God, 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 God. Do you ever take a minute to listen back to what he's saying? Now, he doesn't often speak in that verbal, audible voice, but he will speak through his word every time. You have to chew on it a little bit sometimes, and you have to meditate on it, and you have to let it spin around, but every time that I've needed to hear the word of God's voice, he has spoken loudly and clearly to me. Are you standing, waiting for God today? But then it says, Look what happened next. The spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, son of Benaiah, son of Jael, son of Mathaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph in the middle of the assembly. And he said, listen. Same thing. Listen up. If you want to hear God's voice, you have to listen for it. Now, who is this guy? Jehaziel? I don't know. Right? But God knows who he was. 
He's a very specific guy. He's the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mathaniah, a Levite from the sons of Asaph. I don't know who he is. He's never been in the Bible before. He doesn't appear anywhere again. He was God's man for this time. And the people, you're going to read his response here, they don't question it because he at, he at least had a reputation that when he spoke, he spoke the words of the Lord. That's all it was mattered. It didn't matter who the messenger was. What was important was the message. Are you listening for God's message? Because sometimes he can send a Jehaziel. Sometimes he can use a Greg Ginian or a Vince McDonald. Sometimes he can use someone sitting next to you or, or another believer to, to deliver his message to you. But this, the Jehaziel was his man for this moment. Listen, all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed, which is good because they were very afraid and very dismayed at this great horde. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Do you believe that this morning? Your battle is not yours. Stop trying to take ownership of it. If you are a child of God, the battle belongs to the Lord. It's his. Stop taking it from him. Give it to him and let him keep it. Tomorrow, go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz. I hate when they do that, right? That ascent of Ziz is always a problem. I don't know what that is, but... The Lord knows exactly what your enemy is up to. You don't have to worry about the enemy. Focus on him. Focus on his word and his promises and stop worrying about the enemy. The Lord knows exactly where they are. You will find them at the end of the valley east of the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Stand firm. Hold your position and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them. The Lord will be with you. Right? There is no evidence that this guy is telling the truth other than he's claiming to be speaking for the Lord of God, from the Word of God, giving the Word of God. And sometimes you have to go out and stand where you have no evidence that God's going to work, but just believe that he will. But that is not blind faith. You will say, oh, that's blind faith. No, it's not. It's faith based and established on everything that God has said he is. Are you going to put that faith into action? Stand firm. Men, are you standing firm? Women, are you standing firm? Are you holding the line or are you retreating? Are you compromising? Are you saying, God's not going to handle this. I'm going to go take care of it myself. Do not be afraid. He has to say it twice. And I'm glad because when the horde comes against me, I get afraid more than once. So God's instruction, right? You want God to fight for you? Sometimes you have to stand firm. Sometimes you have to hold fast to his word, even when everything around you is dictating otherwise. Then verse 18, Jehoshaphat, he bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites and the Kohathites and the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a very loud voice. Right? These, these guys, these Levites, the Kohathites, Korahites, they were actually families that were... Levitical families, but some of them were designated to be singers. And, and you can watch it through generational lines that they were the singers in the temple. They would lead people into the worship of God. And these guys stood up. Je Jehoshaphat set the example. What a great king he was. He fell down on his face and he worshiped God. How do you worship God when you fall down on your face? Your humility is your worship. He fell down and not just him, everyone fell down. That's you want to get your face set on the Lord? You want to seek after the Lord? Worship the Lord. Even when circumstances tell you not to. That is especially when we should be worshiping. Nothing happened yet. Do you understand? Only the promise of God's action was given to them. It hadn't happened yet. They preemptively praised God because he responded to their prayer, but nothing had changed in their circumstances. Sometimes we have to preemptively praise God. And I'm not talking about the name it and claim it people and say, if you praise God for a Jaguar, you'll get a Jaguar. If you praise God for a new house, you get a new house. That's baloney. That's not scripture. But if you praise God saying, God, I believe that you're going to be with me and guide me and give me the answer to my problems, he will respond to that every time. So he fasts, he assembles, he prays, they stood, they listened, and now they have to act. 
right? There comes a point every time we're following God where he's going to call us out onto the water, right? We're going to get out of the boat, right? And, and our eyes need to, need to be on him or we can be like Peter and we see the wind and the waves and we sink. And I'm a sinker. <laughs> I sink. But immediately when Peter cried out, Lord, save me, it says he immediately he reached out to him and pulled him into the boat. Even when you're a sinker, you can still put your eyes back on Christ and he will pull you into his boat with him. You don't have to have great faith. You don't even have to have medium faith. You just have to have little itty bitty tiny faith. But your eyes have to be on him. And then when he tells you what to do, you need to do it. Don't be like Jonah. Things did not end up well for him. You know that story, right? God told him what to do, where to go. And he said, uh-uh, I went the other way. And God said, okay, do it the easy way. <laughs> you can do it the hard way. So look at verse 20. It says, they rose early. They didn't say, you know what? Let's sleep in, see what happens. They rose early in the morning and they went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. They weren't in the valley yet. They were in the wilderness. And when they went out, right, there's action. Jehoshaphat stood. He's not in the castle. He's there with them. What a good leader. A good leader goes with his people. He doesn't lead them from behind. He doesn't lead them from way out in front. He's with his people. It says he stood and he said, hear me, Judah, and inhabitants of, inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe his prophets, and you will succeed. Are you hearing me this morning? If you believe in the word of God, you will have success. If you believe God and his promises, you will be established. Do you believe me today? Jehoshaphat was trying to bolster them, right? Jesus, when he was with Jairus, Right? He was going to his house because his daughter was dying and they came to him and they said, don't bother the master anymore, your daughter is dead. Now right there, there was a moment to stop believing, to be hopeless, to be fearless. And Jesus turned and he looked directly at Jairus and he says, don't fear, only believe. And actually the tense of what he says is stop fearing, keep believing. God knows our tendency. Stop fearing, keep believing. And when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy attire as they went before the army and say, give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. Now here's the part of the story that gets completely ridiculous. Jehoshaphat they're, they're, assembles everyone. They're gonna go out to meet the enemy. God says, you won't have to fight. All you have to do is stand. I'm gonna deliver you. I'm gonna be with you, but you still gotta go. And he says, okay, I know what to do. He calls up his generals, he gets Schwarzkopf, he gets MacArthur, he gets Boykin. He says, guys, here's the plan. We need a cantata. <laughs> get Dave Fox over here, tell him we got to get the robes out, we need the red chairs, we need to get the horns, the instruments. He decides the way that they're going to have victory in this battle is that they are going to sing praise to the Lord. That's crazy. That's nuts. That doesn't make any sense. Whew. I'm glad that we serve a God who uses the wisdom of this world and makes it foolishness. He takes the foolish things of this world, he takes the weak things of this world, he takes the broken things of this world, and he uses them to confound the strong and the wise. And God loves to show himself strong on behalf of those who will take a risk and to follow him and to sing praise to him when everything seems like it's falling apart. Do you ever try it? I'm not great at, at singing, but I know that the times that there is a song in my heart, I feel confident in the Lord and my relationship with him. He said, we have a great pastor. Pastor Vince sings all the time. I know he's coming before he gets there because he comes into the office singing. He goes down the hallway from his office to the other end of the hallway singing. He closes the door of the bathroom, I can still hear him singing. <laughs> you think I'm lying. <laughs> There's a song in his heart and I believe it's because He's confident of his relationship with his Savior. I wish there was a song in my heart more often. But the response to God, you want to get God, you want to believe God, you want to bolster yourself in his promises, try literally singing. You can't sing and stay angry. Right? You can't sing and, and remain unpleasant. Some people have to sing louder and some people have to sing harder. <laughs> but you can't do it long without being changed. 
I'm sorry, I'm taking a long time. And when they began to sing, in verse 22, and praise the Lord, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, so that they were routed. For the men of Ammon and Moab rose against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, devoting them to destruction. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they all helped to destroy one another. I like that. You realize that? As they started to sing, the enemy was already destroying themselves. But nothing happened before they started to sing. Right? You want God to move? You want God to work? You want God to give you an answer? Sometimes you've got to take that step of faith before the answer will come. And you have to do it believing in the promises of God. And that's not, that's not easy. It's difficult. It takes faith. But greater is he that is in you that is in the world. Nothing happened until they started to sing. But by the time they got to where the enemy was, look at verse 24. When Judah came to the watchtower of the wilderness, they looked toward the horde. It keeps calling them that. They're not a horde anymore. It's more like a dead horde. And behold, there were dead bodies lying on the ground. None had escaped. Nobody got away. What happened? It says the Lord set an ambush. And actually in the Hebrew it says set ambushers. I don't know what that is, but it doesn't sound good. Right? I don't want the Lord to send ambushers at me, ever. But these guys, he sent ambushers. Was it an angelic host? Was it, I like the King James Version in different parts of the Bible where this has happened before. If you read the story of Gideon and some other stories in the Bible where it says they were discomfited. I don't know what that word means, but that's the example of it right there. When you wake up and you're like, yeah, we're going to go fight the Israelites. Yeah. What'd you say? <laughs> you talking to me? <laughs> Right? Before they even got into battle, it says that the, the Ammonites and the Moabites, they looked at the other people from Edom and said, we don't like you guys, you stink. Oh yeah, you stink. Right? And then somebody said something about somebody's mother, and before you know it, they were all fighting. Right? <laughs> they were killing each other. And then they got done destroying the Edomites, and it says the Moabites and Ammonites, they turned and they destroyed each other. I don't know how it happened, but God said it would, and it did. And they didn't have to fight. When they showed up, they see nothing but dead bodies. And it says, when they, Jehoshaphat and his people came to take their spoil, they found among them in great numbers goods, clothing, precious things, which they took for themselves until they could carry no more. There were three days in taking the spoil, it was so much. On the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Barakah, for there they blessed the Lord. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the valley of Barakah to this day. Barakah means blessing. See, when God gives you the victory, he doesn't just give you the victory, he gives you the spoils. And the example and the proof of that in our life is our lives are the spoil of another's victory. Do you realize that? When Jesus went to the cross, he claimed victory not for himself, but for all of us. Anyone who will put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, he says, no longer are you a children of darkness, you're a children of light. And he didn't just stop there, but he spoils us. He gives us inheritance, he gives us eternal life, he gives us blessings, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. He gives us Life, and life more abundantly. We are all the benefactors of someone else's victory, just like the children of Israel are the benefactors here. And they go to the Valley of Barakah. It wasn't that before, but from then on, it was called the Valley of Praise. And you know why? Because they, before they got to that valley, they were in the wilderness of Tekona, Tekoa, and there they began to praise. If you want to see more valleys of Barakah in your life, start praising God in the wilderness. I'm wrapping up, I promise. I'm sorry, there's a lot here. It says in verse 27, they returned every man of Judah and Jerusalem and Jehoshaphat at their head, returning to Jerusalem with joy, for the Lord made them rejoice over their enemies. Who made them rejoice? It wasn't Jehoshaphat. It wasn't their armies. It wasn't anybody but the Lord. If you want the Lord to make you rejoice, look for him. I think that's where the name Jumpin' Jehoshaphat came from. Have you ever heard that term? Mostly came from Yosemite Sam. Jumpin' Jehoshaphat, right? Well, I think it came from here because as they went back to Jerusalem, I'm sure they were jumping and leaping for joy. They, they got their Cool in the Gang album out and they said, celebrate, good times, come on. As they came to Jerusalem with harps and lyres and trumpets to the house of the Lord. And look at verse 29. The fear of God came on all the kingdoms of the countries when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. <laughs> I'll bet they did. <laughs> Do you realize people are watching you? They know that you're a believer. They know that you've, there's something different about you. And when they see you go through a crisis or a trial or a problem and your response is to praise God and then they see you come through that trial, fear of the Lord will fall on those people. They're going to want to know 
more about your God. They're going to want to know more about your Savior. The fear of the Lord will come on those. And then here's what God wants to give to us, verse 30. So the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet, for his God gave him rest all around. In Hebrews, it talks about the rest of God. In Hebrews 4, it tells us that they're, they're still in front of us a Sabbath rest for the people of God, that we should strive to enter that rest. How do you look this morning? Better should I ask, to whom are you looking? In Hebrews 12, 2, it says to fix your eyes on Jesus. Set your eyes, determine to keep your eyes on Jesus. And, and it, it can waver, it can get off, and we just have to recenter our course, course. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Who is he? The author and the finisher, or the author and the perfecter of our faith. He's the beginning and the end of our faith. He's the sum of all we would believe. Fix your eyes on Jesus on him and you will have success you will be established but you need to refuse to give up ground refuse to compromise you have to refuse to respond in fear and you think well how i fear is fear how i respond to what i can't help yes you can it's a decision of the will it feels like you can't respond any other way but the bible says that we can overcome our fear with what we know not so much what we know who we know if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal savior, your biggest problem is not financial. It's not emotional. It's not physical. The biggest problem you have is a sin problem. And that sin problem is gonna keep you out of relationship with the Father. It's gonna actually send you to hell. Be separated from him forever. See, in the, it talked about the Moabites, the Ammonites, but those me unites, right? That's who gets us every time. When we put ourselves above God or in place of God, we're never going to have a relationship with God. But there is a solution to that problem. Jesus Christ died for your sin on the cross, and he said anyone who believes in me can have eternal life. You have to put your faith in him, and then your biggest problem might be taken care of. Jesus didn't say, I'm going to take all your problems away, though. But he did say, I'll hold your hand, and I'll be with you with any, through any problem, through any trial. The rest of us, the battle has been fought. The battle has been won. We have received forgiveness. We have received sonship, right? We are called the sons and daughters of God. Will you enter into his rest? You might know the peace. You might have peace with God, right, through, through his son Jesus, but do you have the peace of God, the peace that passes understanding? You can have it, but it comes by faith and trust and giving up your right to worry. Would you pray with me? Lord God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for Jehoshaphat. Lord, it's not somebody we study often, but I believe you have a lot to say to us through his testimony and through the testimony of all the children of Judah that, that would believe that you were going to deliver them. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here going through a storm that has enemies coming against them, Lord, whether they be physical, emotional, relational, or something else, God, that they would put into practice some of these principles today and begin to fix their eyes on you and to worship you despite the circumstances and then to hear from you and respond in obedience to what you tell them to do. Lord, I pray for all of us that your spirit would fall on us, God, and that we would leave here blessed for coming. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen.